cooking today? I am cooking your favourite Mi Tai Bak. And what are the different ingredients? We have your favourite Mi Tai Bak. <laughs> okay, this is what you call the, the mouse or the rat noodles. The rat's tail noodles, I remember right, that. Yeah. And then this is the pork. Right, these are the two main ingredients. You must buy a little bit of the fatty pork. You buy it too lean, then you won't get. You know, it become very dry. So we begin with the canola oil. Okay. What kind of prawns are those? Tiger prawns. When the oil hits up, then I'm going to just fry the prawns. But this prawns is not necessary for mi tai bak. Mm. Okay, but it's just that I like to put some colour mm. to the meat type. Mm. And you remember, right, how you love to eat prawns? Right? Yes. <laughs> All by your lonely self, you can eat one kg of freshly peeled prawns, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, and that was when you were three years old. <laughs> I will put a little bit of the soya sauce, soy sauce. on the prawns. I know it's all aga-aga. Of course, <laughs> yes, of course, aga-aga, you know. The yeah. chef who yeah. are doing it for a living yeah. would have it precisely. Oh, yeah, one yeah. teaspoon, one tablespoon and all yeah, this. Yeah. But you know, mummy, yeah. don't cook for a living, you know. Yeah. I just cook for people that I love. So when mummy has a good day, it tastes better. <laughs> when I'm stressed, the food also becomes stressed, right? Okay, so now you see, so oh, okay. this is oh, also they're lightly yeah. charred. Yeah. Right, so you don't want it to be over overcooked. Yeah, overcooked. Just when it starts to curl and turn pink. Right, right, yeah. Because we are going to put this on top of the mi tai bak. Okay, so this is this is your last step, right? Later, so you put it aside right. to cool. Yeah. So now you see, this is the pan, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So now you put the oil on it again. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is now to fry the pork. I was just thinking that, you know, like you were saying that like you like to add different ingredients in like the prawns or because we have this memory of when I was a kid, we were eating a lot of prawns, right? Mm -hmm. so, so a lot of your cooking sometimes is, seems to be coming out of this, the family memories we have. And I remember pork was something that Amma used to make. There were six of us in yeah. the family. So one of the key things that when Amma had to look after six children, yeah. all growing up and always hungry. So she always cook meals that is one meal. Oh, one pot meals. Yeah, one yeah one pot meal. So that is easier, you know, mm -hmm. rather than having to cook a lot of different ones. I prefer to fry my pork first. Yeah. Okay, and then after that, I put the garlic. Oh, why do you do that? That's because I, I wanted the garlic not to be like, too crunchy. Oh, I wanted it okay, to okay. be part of the flavouring for the pork. Okay, okay. Now you can see the pork is cooked, yeah. right? It's not burnt but it's thoroughly cooked. Thoroughly cooked. Right, yeah. No? It's not pink anymore. Oh yeah, right? and it has juices coming out of it. So that's right. like pork juice, right? I remember we spoke before that when you really started cooking was when you moved out moved away from home and was here in the US. In the US. Yeah, so in the yeah. US you got no Mi Tai Bak. Yeah, okay? so, so what did you do? You know, when, because when so you we buy a rice cooker. Yeah. When I was studying in America, that was mm -hmm. when I started doing a lot of the cooking, you know, mm -hmm. because you got to cook for yourself. Mm -hmm. So now I put in all of the Mi Tai Bak. Mm -hmm. The Mi Tai Bak, you should always try yeah. to buy it fresh yeah. from the market. So now, I'm going to put this that's the dark, dark soy, sauce. soy sauce. Okay, yeah. to give it the colour. And when we cook this, mm. I lower the fire a bit. Mm. Okay, because I don't want it to be too soft. Mm. Very recently also, you sent me baby clay pots full of this meat type bark. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah. And I'm always so impressed by that because you, you work so hard, you have a full-time job, you run your own company, and you've been a career woman, pretty much a professional woman, all my adult life and even mm. when I was a kid I remember at one point you were working two jobs and doing a PhD but you were still sort of cooking for us you seem to really like clay pots is that because it's just easier to put something on the stove when you're working and you know how has your working life maybe influenced the way you cook well as I said I don't cook for a living I cook yeah. <laughs> for love <laughs> you know, yeah, and I always enjoy cooking for friends and for mm -hmm. my family, you know, especially for you, mm -hmm. because you just love to eat a lot. Yeah. <laughs> 
I do and love your you food. And then you are also a bit fussy, right? Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. You must eat everything fresh, everything must be good, yeah. homemade and all those things. Yeah. That looks good. Wow. Are we ready to eat? We are. Yeah. Can I ask you a question, B1? Is this very typical Hokkien methodology of cooking? This dish actually is very Malaysian. Oh, okay. Yeah. You don't find this very much in the Cantonese. Mm -hmm. The way that they cook is quite different. I would think that when it comes to clay pot, I think the Cantonese do it a whole lot more better. Oh really? You feel yes, that way? Yes, then the Hokkien. Because I think the Hokkien cooking for clay pot is a little bit rough. It's not as refined. But what I love about the whole the way you made the dish and, and the way Kat explained it is how nothing is fixed in tradition. It just keeps evolving. It, it's made up of memories and family traditions and all of that makes the dish. Yes, that's right. A lot of home cooking. Okay, is that you calibrate it based on who you are serving in the house. I also love how when we were talking about the dish, uh, Kat, you have a very specific memory of how your mom encountered like this Malaysian version. Well, this is the story, right? We were talking about this because I remember eating the mee tai bak, these rat's tails noodles growing up. I was doing a job in KL, this was before COVID. And someone that I was working with had taken me to an old traditional sort of the top place in Chinatown in KL. And it reminded me so much of this memory from when I was young mm. that when mom and I then went out again, I took her to the same place to try this. So then suddenly Mi Tai Bak came back into our <laughs> diet again oh, because of this encounter. Now when did you first start cooking like really for, even for yourself? I was in the US. Mm -hmm. I was doing my master's program because when you're growing up, the kitchen belongs to my mom. So there were nine person, and the table is the size of this table. <laughs> it's a round table. And then for daytime, you just have your porridge. So some of us go to school, we come back late. Oh, it has okay. a veggie table, usually a tauge, and it has a protein that is usually your tau kwa. Mm -hmm. Then you have a soup, mm -hmm. okay, and then you may have some pork that is minced, you know, and steamed. Yeah. And you're saying the boys always get the chicken wings, right? Right. No, the chicken legs. <laughs> the chicken leg, the chicken yeah, leg. Yeah, the boys always get chicken legs. And that is only during festival. Mm. So it's like your ancestors worship the... So the food kind of changed with the calendar. It, it was special things for ancestor worship. You almost marked the calendar with the sort of food you ate. Every time you know that there is a, a family worship for ancestor worship, you look forward to it because then you will have one steamed chicken. So my mum would cook that chicken and then she'll leave it on the altar. Mm -hmm. Okay, then there will be fruits. Then there will be the steamed chicken and sometimes there's a steamed pork. And it's yeah. always your grandmother or your mom that prepares the food? Yeah, my mom. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, because my grandmother was blind. Mm -hmm. So therefore it's my mom who always cooks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now that food or protein is so plentiful, do you you don't keep those same traditions? So in fact, the simple meals that my mom cook becomes my occasional meals now. Mm -hmm. Having a cold or, you know, I had not much of appetite, I would just cook porridge. Mm. That's your comfort food? Yeah, it's my comfort food. It's interesting what you're saying about how much it's tied back to when you were younger is what now becomes your comfort food. Because I would say it's the same. Like, that's why this whole thing with the Mi Tai Bak kind of happened in KL and I brought you out to try it, was because there was a comfort that came from that memory. I can't tell you how much I love it when I have a stressful day and you send me a small, tiny clay pot full of Mi Tai Bak. <laughs> <laughs> it just makes my day. <laughs> was Mi Tai Bak um, uh, a noodle that featured much when you were growing up? Oh. Was your family like mostly eating meat pork? We will have bihun. Bihun is easier to buy because you can go and buy from the supermarket. You know, but of course we don't have supermarket at the time. We have provision shop. So mm -hmm. for 50 cents, you can cook for a whole family. So all that you need to do is to put a lot of tauge and you just put dark sauce. That's it. And that is it. That's your bihun. Whereas meat Thai bark, you got to buy it fresh. Mm. Yeah, and it is a little bit more expensive. And Bita I guess you also have to cook on the same day, right? Whereas the, the right. dry noodle you can store. Mm, yeah. That's right, that's yeah. right, yeah. Is the fish that you mostly had, like, 
growing up. Mm. Um, ikan bilis or was there other kinds of fish? Ikan bilis is the first one mm. because you know it's cheap. Yeah. Yeah, and then you can save it over a period of time. You know, so you never buy all those big fish. So you always buy kuning fish, you know, the tiny little fish. So you have it steamed with lots of ginger mm. and soya sauce. Yeah, so you just eat all the kuning fish. And because we are young, so they know that you can handle the bones. <laughs> yeah, it's very interesting because when you think about food, it is not about the taste. It is about the empathy. Mm. Yeah. That's such a good word. I've never heard that used with food, but I really think that mother who cooks also does it out of love. She yes. shows love for her children by cooking. And that empathy towards an older person in the family or someone who can't see or has another disability. I mean, it's amazing that food has such a wide ranging blanket of emotions. And so when you think about home cooked food, it is food that you cook for the people that you want to serve. When you think about Michelin star restaurant cook, you know, it is about the chef himself. It is you being privileged yeah. to yeah. eat what he cooks. Whereas when you think about home cooked meals, it is not about you, but it is about the people that you are cooking for. Yeah. And that is why I always believe that whatever people talk about a home-cooked meal, it has a feeling and empathy behind it. It is not an arrogance that I'm a good chef, right. you know, and this is the way it should be cooked, and this is the way you should enjoy it. Mm. But having said that, your food is delicious. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> when you started a family, you also still tried to cook at home, right? Kat was saying mm. that. Yeah, did you, do you remember like what were some of those things that you, you cook? Kat and Malena. Mm. Uh, also love pizza. I began to learn how to make pizza and they're not very much into ham, so you put lots of more cheese in. and they're not into vegetables, mm. so you also <laughs> don't put that, right? I don't remember the pizza because it might have been when we were much, much, much younger, but I remember that we were really privileged growing up. Like, you really spoiled us, actually, because I have this distinct memory when we lived in the East and you started to try to make gumbo, like New Orleans gumbo. <laughs> wow. And that was after we had gone on a trip to New Orleans. And I remember you, you bought back some of the spices and you literally went and looked for the sausages. And I remember it was a good three months of eating gumbo. <laughs> you know, so like- Who like stores well? You know, yeah. <laughs> but then you'd also go and find someone in Singapore who made gumbo. So there was this American man who was selling gumbo out in... I don't think he had a restaurant. I can't even remember. I just have a distinct memory and you would buy that occasionally. And so it was really interesting, actually, because our relationship with food as a family really maps onto our experiences. Yeah, and you studied also in the US. Mm. And mm. Did you bring back any things that you would try it with the girls or like you cook for yourself still? All that I was cooking very much when I was staying in the dormitory is that it's just a rice cooker. But going away from home, yeah. did that make you kind of think that you wanted to cook home-cooked food? Because often that is the catalyst for having people come back to their own yeah. food. Well, it depends on the country that you go to because right. I spent 18 months in the US and, mm -hmm. and the US I was in was not like New York. It was like Wisconsin, mm. you know? Everything's potato, you know, <laughs> everything's like cheese, and I'm not a cheese person. Mm. Yeah. But once a month, we will go to Chicago, mm -hmm. you know, Chinatown. Then I'll go to my friend's house, and then we'll cook, you know, like maybe a steamed fish or something like that. A curry chicken, of course. Mm. <laughs> that is always easy. I don't think you take enough credit in this question about how much your university days and what you learned cooking in university affected us. When I first went to university, you taught me the same thing, like the rice cooker. Then you sent me the recipes for doing like chicken rice in the rice cooker. <laughs> Even if it didn't translate to cooking at home because you know, there's a lot more available in Singapore, right? And we are a very foodie family. You used to travel halfway across Singapore to go to Geylang to get, you know, the famous um, crab bihun to eat, wait an hour to pick it up. You know, like there was a certain commitment to food. But you also did teach us. I remember this because I never used a rice cooker in my life and I had no <laughs> table in my dorm room. It was on the floor. And I remember like thinking that this is pretty gross. 
<laughs> and you did the hero with like this rice and then the chicken on top on the floor. Right, right. This idea of how much, you know, your life experience imprints on your kids, I think definitely. I would never have gotten a rice cooker and put chicken in the rice cooker. <laughs> this is really just savory, it's got a lot of umami flavors without being like um, greasy. Thank so you. thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so gracious both of you. Stay. But next time chili crab. <laughs> Otherwise you make the same thing again and again. <laughs>